Welcome to C2G Talk, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with influential practitioners and thought leaders to explore the governance challenges raised by emerging approaches to alter the climate. I'm uh, Mark Turner, Senior Communications Consultant with Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, and I'm speaking today with uh, Ken Caldera, who's an emeritus investigator with Carnegie Science and is world famous for his work on the global carbon cycle and climate change. Mr. Caldera was the lead author for the IPCC's uh, fifth assessment report and a co-author of the 2010 US National Academy of America's Climate Choices record, uh, Report. He also participated in the UK Royal Society's geoengineering panel in 2009, which set the stage for many of the policy discussions we in C2G are hoping to catalyze. He's also a senior scientist at Breakthrough Energy, which supports innovation to reach zero carbon emissions. Welcome, Ken Kandera, to uh, C2G Talk. Good to be here. So you've been studying climate change for a few years now and have played a prominent role in informing efforts to tackle it. How would you describe the moment we've reached in 2022, both in terms of the science and our understanding of climate change and how humanity is responding to that science to limit its impacts? Well, that's a whole uh, tangled ball of yarn type question there. Um, I started studying climate science in the 1980s and I remember us uh, saying, well, you know, right now the signal of climate change is in the noise of natural variability, but sometimes in the, in the 1990s, that signal will start rising out of the noise. And, and indeed it did with Ben Santer and the IPCC saying it was a discernible human influence on the climate system. And uh, we wrote a paper, uh, Marty Hoffert and I and others in 1998 in Nature Magazine say, putting out the scale of this, what would be needed to stabilize atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations or CO2 concentrations. And, pointing out that it would need, mean a massive transition to carbon emission free power at, at scales that are sort of orders of magnitude greater than, than what was being deployed then. And unfortunately, um, and so since that time, the another uh, sort of point was I remember uh, doing a congressional briefing on ocean acidification in 2005 and at that briefing, I was asked by some uh, members of Congress, oh, you know, what should the, uh, you know, what should our emission, uh, what, what should the temperature target be or the CO2 stabilization target be? And I said, oh, I don't think we should think in terms of uh, stabilization targets. I think we should think in terms of emissions targets. And I said, oh, I, they said, what should the emissions target be? And I said, oh, it should be zero. And I said, in the same way that, you know, if you're asking about mugging little old ladies, you don't ask what the, uh, you know, what's the goal for our rate of mugging little old ladies, you try to reduce it as far as you can. And the con members of Congress laughed at that. And it was seen like, as some, you know, out of the sense of reasonableness. And so it's really interesting to me to see here we are 17 years later, and people are accepting that the target is zero emissions is pretty broadly accepted. And, and so in terms of what people say, we've come a long way uh, and where we have come uh, much less far is in terms of what people do. Right. And, and it is true that solar power has become a lot cheaper, winds become cheaper, and there is uh, increased uh, production of renewables. But here, even in California, we're still building natural gas plants. The, the rate at which we would need to roll out carbon emission-free energy technologies needs to be I don't know exact number, but say 10 times bigger at least than what we're doing now. And so I think there's increased recognition of what we need to do, but the social system hasn't really uh, embraced the scale of the effort that's required. In terms of the science and how it's presented to policymakers, some have questioned the continuing utility of the intergovernmental panel on climate change, at least in its current form. What, what are your thoughts on that? Where, where are the key ways in which science is needed to inform policy today? And how could the IPCC help in that? Well, first of all, I think the IPCC, especially working group one, has done a tremendous service. Uh, IPCC, at least the first report, I forget when it came out, 91 or two, 92, something like this. And that 
around that time, there really was a consensus among the physical scientists about the basic physics and biogeochemistry of climate change. And there was a bunch of noise, some of it promoted by, you know, the usual vested interests, you know, trying to pretend that there wasn't a scientific consensus. So I think uh, that the IPCC, especially the physical science component, did a tremendous service in demonstrating that there really was a scientific consensus, despite the people who were trying to suggest otherwise. Uh, so then after a while, the IPCC added working group two on impacts and adaptation, and then working group three on climate change mitigation. And those provided useful information uh, but really there's less consensus. Yeah, everybody agrees on the laws of physics pretty much, but not everybody agrees on what technologies may or may not play out in the future or what technologies may or may not be accepted by societies. And um, so anyway, I think the utility of the physics side has been huge. The, the, um, and the utility of the other reports has also been large uh, as an information source. Even I, just today, I needed something on carbon capture and storage and I went to an IPCC report to find it. And so as a reference source, it's, it's valuable. And so for me, I guess the question is, is the amount of time that it's taking up of research scientists commensurate with the uh, you know, social return on, uh, on what comes out of the reports. And my feeling, I guess there's another factor too. And that is with when we, people were saying, oh, we have to uh, stop with, you know, smoking indoors. It wasn't always saying like, oh, it's the latest science that says we have to stop indoor smoking. The, basically people said, we've known for decades that this causes cancer and we're subjecting children to carcinogens. And I also think this is true of the climate system that we've known now for decades that we basically have to eliminate our emissions if we want to stop the planet for, from warming and that we should want to stop the planet from warming. And that, um, and so my feeling, and this kind of saying, oh, there's a new round of reports and it's the new round of reports that says we have to do something. No, it's the stuff we've known for decades that it means we have to do something. And so I would actually like to see the IPCC move to something more efficient that maybe there's an encyclopedia and and that you may you know maybe each cycle they update the chapters but they don't start ab initio and maybe every once in a while you need a new chapter or a chapter so out of date you just remove it but but you know i i think when i was a kid this is uh, it was in the pre wikipedia days and we used to have like an encyclopedia britannica in the house and used to get these yearbooks of these updates to the encyclopedia. And it's, I almost feel like this kind of model of updating an encyclopedia might be more efficient, but I'm all, I think the IPCC has done a tremendous service. It acts as an excellent reference source. And it's really a question is, could, could those benefits be achieved with less investment? Um, I wanted to pick up uh, the point you made earlier about talking to Congress about zero. Uh, so we've seen a proliferation over the last couple of years of countries, organizations talking about net zero goals. Um, obviously the world is quite a long way of working out what that means in practice. And we've seen the rising concerns that the net in the net zero uh, leaves loopholes for companies and countries to keep emitting. Can you share your kind of thoughts on the relative value of net zero as an approach versus real zero? And, and, and to what extent do people understand the difference between the two? I'm a big fan of carbon dioxide removal as a research project. I'm a little skeptical of incorporating it too deeply into decarbonization plans that uh, you know, back to my the mugging little old ladies. Uh, I don't know if that's a politically correct thing to say, but the the uh, you know that I, I think we basically need to head for as close as we can get to zero emissions, not just net emissions, but gross emissions from human activities. 
Well, that should be the goal. You know, there are certain activities that that's going to be really expensive to do. I, I mean, and one or or just problematic. I mean, I mean, let's let's say um, you know, long distance aviation flying New York to Sydney. Right now, liquid hydrocarbon fuels are pretty much the only way to do that, and you know, you could. Uh, in principle, uh, get some, say, carbon from a biomass facility and then take electrolytic hydrogen from non-zero emitting electricity sources and make synthetic liquid hydrocarbons. But, you know, if it's cheaper to use fossil hydrocarbons and then remove the CO2 from the atmosphere later, well, then by all means do whatever is cheapest, assuming the other externalities are similar. And, and so, uh, yeah, so I think there might be a role for carbon dioxide removal, right. but, but the idea that, oh, we can just go on emitting vast amounts of carbon and the assumption uh, I, I, that we can clean it up through carbon dioxide removal. And I, I guess there's also there's two levels of, uh, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to fly a plane today burning fossil hydrocarbons. And simultaneously, I'm going to be running an air direct air capture plant. That I can buy. Now, the other one where, where oh, we're going to fly a plane today, and somebody a few decades from now, or maybe you know, is is later going to remove our CO2. That this this that one seems disingenuous at best. Uh, so, so you but, touch on some pretty crucial issues there. I you know, as people get to grips with this and what do we focus on and so forth. There's this idea of the mitigation hierarchy that's emerged, you know, that you should prioritize avoiding and minimizing emissions before removal. At the same time, assuming that there will be tough to abate residual emissions and uh, all approaches will likely be needed in some form to achieve these goals within the time that we've left to achieve them, you know, um, there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be done now on carbon dioxide removal. So. What are your thoughts on how you go about that in practice without undermining the urgency of emission cuts, without creating mitigation deterrence of the emission cuts? The moral hazard question that some people refer to it as. So I'm a physical scientist who sort of ob observes the policy process, but I don't pretend to great policy expertise. And, but you know, as a sort of an informed physical scientist, the idea of a carbon carbon tax always seemed appealing to me that it, you know, I've listened to economists saying how it's economically efficient and all this kind of thing. Yet, you know, politically, it seems hard to get a carbon tax. And, uh, you know, whereas just regulating what kinds of technologies people are allowed to build seems more socially acceptable. And, so if you tell people you can't build a natural gas plant or you can't build a coal plant, but you let them build a wind plant or a solar plant or maybe a nuclear plant, that people want the electricity. So there's local benefit uh, to building this carbon emission-free system. And so basically all you have to do is ban what's bad. And then because people want the energy services, they'll build the carbon emission-free energy systems. In contrast, the carbon dioxide removal has no direct local benefit. All, you know, has lots of direct local costs and the benefit is to the rest of the world or to the entire world and for decades and centuries into the future. And so you need a system of incentives and regulation and so on to be put in place to make sure that people do it. Uh, I, I know, I mean, if you just go to the example, example of sulfur scrubbers on coal plants that uh, in I heard this is hearsay, but I heard that in China, a bunch of plants had built sulfur scrubbers, but it was cheaper to pay off the inspectors than it was to run the sulfur scrubbers. And so even though the coal plants had sulfur scrubbers, they weren't using them. And, you know, for average uh, gigawatt scale kind of facility, the costs of carbon capture are going to be hundreds of millions of dollars a year, I believe I might have those numbers off. And that anyway, just, you know, unless you have really strong governance, keeping that system operating in an uncorrupted way. So, 
anyway, so I just I think the sort of the game theory of it really it's just a lot, of, you know, avoiding emissions through ba effectively banning technologies, which I know the economists don't like so much because it's not economically efficient, but it seems like it might be socially efficient in the sense that we might actually be able to get it done. So anyway, I'm concerned about, you know, will society really um, develop the appropriate regulatory and policing uh, stru structures to govern carbon dioxide removal? I mean, I mean, we one of the things we see right now is, you know, some removal say through chemical means or physical and chemical means with geologic storage is expensive and you know people have given different numbers 400 dollars a ton 600 dollars a ton co2 you know and meanwhile there are people selling forest offsets right. for 10 or 15 dollars or something like this and uh you know that to have something that's like permanent storage and really is a reversal of taking fossil fuels out of the ground and throwing it into the atmosphere. They really are taking the carbon out of the atmosphere and throwing it back in the ground versus, uh, you know, some kind of storage in a forest that may or may not uh, be there decades or a century from now, or there might be a forest fire, who knows what. And so I, I, you know, and how the relative values of those different kinds of carbon storage get reflected in markets and all this is super complicated. But right. I, anyway, so I, I think that carbon dioxide removal can play an important role in our models for that last little bit. For example, we see in the models, like as you ramp down the CO2 constraints, you know, you start with natural gas, then it might use natural gas with CCS. But for that last little bit, if you have a peaker plant that's running once or twice a year, it's, it's cheaper to run that peaker plant once or twice a year with no carbon capture. And then you have another plant that has a carbon capture facility running 24 seven. So it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's has a high um, utilization where if you're only using all this carbon capture stuff once or twice a year, that's a lot of capital costs that you're not using. Yeah. So anyway, I think the challenge, it's a tough thing. It's a really tough regulatory problem and it could be a big contribution, Right. but I'm glad I'm not in the meetings <laughs> having to design that. I mean, you, you keep on stressing you're a physical scientist. Is there, because um, obviously there are, and you, you alluded to this, both potential nature-based and more technological geochemical approaches to carbon removal. And actually some people might think the nature-based uh, approaches have a, have a lot of co-benefits, which, uh, <laughs> but, you know, also there are challenges around permanence, land use, all the rest of it. Um, do you, uh, uh, and this will bring us a little bit onto the next topic as well, do you think there's still some sort of intrinsic preference to using nature rather than technology, if there is such a contradiction? Um, and, and does that make sense through, in, through the lens that you look at these things? Well, this, let me just say a preface thing before getting to the question in that, you know, one of the main reasons I'm, I think humans are fairly malleable and adaptable. And if we could organize ourselves, we can protect the least, you know, the people who are most vulnerable. And, but ecosystems and things like ice sheets and things like this, uh, you know, have much less adaptive capacity than we, we do, I believe. And, and so, uh, you know, a lot of the reasons I want to avoid climate change is to protect the existing ecosystems. The, uh, and so, I th you know, so people, including myself, have a positive association with natural systems and they just seem less dangerous to us or less scary. Uh, as, as you mentioned, reforestation especially has huge co-benefits and you're both, uh, if it's done as the way I would be most happy, you know, you'd both be restoring a natural ecosystem and absorbing carbon. And I would actually look at the uh, protection of the ecosystem as primary and the co-benefit as, uh, as the uh, 
you know, is the carbon storage. And in a way, things I think have gotten turned around in that, uh, you know, that people, it's hard to sell forest protection for purposes of just environmental protection and e ecosystem protection or biodiversity. And so people are using the carbon storage dimension as a means for protecting ecosystems. And I, it, you know, again, this is the world, if I were I king of the world, we would be protecting forests because forests are worth protecting in and of themselves. And then the car, we count the carbon storage as a well, Let's see, let's see but, what we can do about that appointment. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, but uh, yeah, but on the other hand, you know, I think there's that, well, there's an emotional attraction to the nature-based solutions. Uh, another paradigm is that, oh, we try to do everything in as concentrated a way as we can and as dense a way as we can. And ideally, if we can make human activity be as compact as possible, that we leave more of the world available for nature. And so, you know, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and so, again, I, I guess with the nature-based solutions that my general outlook is to look at the carbon storage as a co-benefit. And so if, if, you know, if it makes sense to help protect the soils and, and for, in farmlands and that results in more carbon being in the soil, great. And if, uh, if um, I mean, I mean here, here's to give an example. We um, we did a study showing that boreal forests, so forests that are on snowy ground in the Arctic, that they have a net warming influence. That that even though they store carbon, that um, you know that a snowy field reflects a lot of sunlight to space, whereas the dark forest absorbs the sunlight. And even though and that, that absorbing the sunlight of the forest is a stronger effect than the carbon storage. So we published this paper and some people said, oh, well, should we cut down the boreal forest? I said, well, no, I'm trying to prevent climate change to save the natural ecosystems. So to try to destroy natural ecosystems to, uh, to prevent climate change is completely wrongheaded from my perspective. And so, yeah, and so this is why I would say I think the case of the boreal forest highlights that I think it's the protection of the ecosystem that's primary and, and carbon storage is a means to that end. And so, so, so if you're restoring a natural ecosystem, it's one thing, but a lot of this carbon storage efforts, are you planting, you know, it's basically a tree farm, you're planting a monoculture of some loblolly pine or some fast growing species and and it's, you know, it's basic, you know, you might even use Roundup to kill off the things that you don't like. And maybe we'll use some insecticides to keep that, you know, the leaves from being eaten. And anyway, you know, so anyway, I'm all for carbon storage in natural systems. I, uh, a, a similar thing is protection of like mangroves and peat mm -hmm. and so on. And, you know, these things aren't, you know, so the, these things are not big carbon sinks. They're not really absorbing lots of carbon, but they contain a lot of carbon and you should avoid, you know, you should avoid disturbing that. You, but, you mentioned the um, reflectivity of uh, the boreal forests or the albedo issue. Um, I'm using this as a segue to, to, okay. to move on to the next topic. I don't know, but there's another potential approach being discussed to manage the risks of overshooting the uh, Paris temperature goals known collectively as solar radiation modification or solar geoengineering, essentially the idea that humanity might intentionally reflect back some sunlight to reduce temperatures. Um, you were involved in the Royal Society report back in 2009, which kind of identified and explored many of the key issues around this. Has the understanding of these approaches and, and, and how to govern them advanced significantly since then? And if so, how? Uh, first, there, yes, there have been a lot of advances. I mean, let me just say a little bit of history that, that um, I used to work at Lawrence Livermore Lab and uh, Edward Teller and Lowell Wood were proponents of researching uh, solar geoengineering. And I hadn't, even though I, both Lowell Wood and I were working at Lawrence Livermore Lab, I hadn't met him there. We were at a meeting in, um, uh, Aspen, Colorado, and David Keith was there. And 
Wall was making excessive claims on behalf of solar geoengineering, but nobody had done any real climate model simulations. And both David Keith and I said, oh, that'll never work because you know, CO2 works around the whole planet all the time and sunlight's just in the daytime and it's mostly at the equator and not you know, mostly in the summer. And so I went back to my office and with my colleague, uh, Govinda Sami Bala, we did the first climate model simulations of solar geoengineering using a three-dimensional climate model. And it worked much, and originally our idea was to show that it wouldn't work. And it worked in the model much better than uh, we ever anticipated. And part of the, what happened was that the climate system feedbacks are so powerful in governing the climate system's response to changes in forcing that basically, you know, that a doubling of atmospheric CO2 traps around four watts per square meter uh, of outgoing energy. But whether you, if you have sea ice or ocean, that can change a hundred watts per square meter of reflectivity. Also the ice on top of the ocean insulates the ocean from the overlying atmosphere and prevents the ocean heat from warming the atmosphere. And so what we found was that if you more or less cool the earth down enough so that the sea ice returns to where it was status quo ante, that more or less you'd get some approximation of the previous climate. And, and so since that time, first of all, there's been lots of studies that have more or less um, uh, confirmed that basic result. Uh, you know, there's been a lot more advances in understanding the differential effects on the hydrological cycle versus temperature. And that's the climate, climate physics part that I'm more familiar with. There's also been a lot of advances in understanding how aerosol particles get transported and interact and related chemistry in the stratosphere. And that, that's part that I'm not particularly expert on, but, but I don't think that anything has uh, changed any fundamental pictures that, you know, over the last two decades. I mean, for one thing, we've had big volcanoes like Mount Pinatubo and Mount Agong. And so, you know, they're, they're, and Mount Pinatubo is more, was more or less the size of a, what a full-time solar geoengineering deployment would be. And so, you know, there's some experience base, at least relevant experience to suggest that the models are not too far off. But what may have changed, um, if not so much this understanding, is the context in which these ideas are being presented, the sense of urgency. Well, what do you think the likelihood is now? What's your sort of feeling that as that sense of urgency writes, that some organization or, or, or group, even for the lack of a social agreement, will feel climate change acutely enough to attempt to actually do this? to try some form of solar radiation modification over the coming, what, what could precipitate that kind of action? Yes, as you point out, when we uh, did that first study, which was published in 2000, but we started, I think in 1998, that uh, it, for us, it was just a thought experiment, an idealized test of a model that was sort of a science fiction story that we were doing for fun. And we never really thought that people, you know, that large numbers of people would take it seriously as something we might actually want to do. And so, you know, again, I don't claim uh, clairvoyance, but the, 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 the scenario that seems most plausible to me for actual use of solar geoengineering would be if uh, temperatures in the tropics uh, really start causing massive crop failures and potentially famines and, and so on. Uh, the, there was a paper uh, a year or two ago that did an estimate and said that basically to have enough solar geoengineering to cool the earth by one degree Celsius would cost around $18 billion per year. And you can probably multiply or divide that by a factor of five or something to, but you know, let's just say in that kind of $18 billion a year ballpark, which is little enough money that individual tropical countries or coalitions of them could muster that. And uh, now I think 
given advanced social systems and farming and so on, there's enough food in the world, but there's already, uh, you know, famines or near famines in various parts of the world today. And so we're not, uh, social systems aren't necessarily responding appropriately to today's food security threats. And so I think a coalition of tropical countries, uh, yeah, oh, I should also point out that, that there have been a number of studies that suggest at least in the high emission scenarios, that substantial parts of the tropic, tropics could become essentially unlivable outdoors, uh, at least some of the time where if, if the heat and humidity gets beyond a certain point, then you can no longer cool your body through sweating and uh, it's projected that, that it's at least a possibility that substantial portions of the tropics could be in that situation by the end of the century. The biggest reason why I'm in favor of researching solar geoengineering is solar geoengineering is the only approach known that can cause the earth to start cooling in our lifetimes, in the terms, uh, in the political careers of uh, political leaders. And so that if there is a crisis where there's ongoing famine year after year from ongoing crop failure, and you're the leader of a country and you think I could potentially save millions of lives, not only in my country, but throughout the tropics, and we just have to make this $18 billion a year investment and we can do it in a, co with, in a coalition of countries that are similarly affected. That, uh, that, uh, that that seems at least to me like a plausible scenario. And I think that it could also be used probably initially not as an actual deployment, but as a threat that says, look, if you don't give us aid, and uh, you know, address our food security needs, we're going to have to do this. And so I, I think the fact that solar geoengineering becomes a credible threat uh, by tropical countries, that the idea that it would get used to try to induce increased aid first, as opposed to actual deployment. But, but I, I, you know, it, I th again, if, if you're a leader of a country and uh, you, know, you haven't been able to industrialize your economy and so you, can't, you don't have your population working indoors and so you have an economy that's based on outdoor work, uh, you know, that if you thought and you were and people and you were facing widespread famine, I would think a political leader would be remiss not to consider uh, a solar geoengineering deployment. But I think, I think that there's been a narrative about how solar geoengineering is in the interests of the, the, the sort of rich and the powerful. And I, I think the fact that it's something that is effective and low cost transfers a lot of power to people who uh, are marginalized. Uh, anyway, so. so there was a campaign recently launched, uh, January 17, on the um, by a group of academics and researchers uh, calling for an agreement on the non use of solar geoengineering and a, a number of ideas attached to that, including no public funding, uh, no outdoor experiments, essentially to address what they deem to be an unacceptable risk. You recently wrote a blog aligning some of your thoughts uh, after being invited to sign up on that. Can you share some of the um, arguments that you, you gave? Yeah. Uh, you know, first of all, I think there should be a presumption of unfettered scientific, uh, you know, freedom of scientific exploration. And, and so I think there is a case to be made for preventing knowledge acquisition when that knowledge would enable somebody to do great harm and also where there's some likelihood that somebody so enabled might actually do it. 
and that there's no other uh, reasonably easy way to prevent that from happening. But if we think of what is a, a realistic solar geoengineering operation look like, you know, the, the, you would need a fleet of airplanes operating continuously from an air base. Uh, you know, those planes would need to get fueled, reloaded, uh, and, and you know there would be a variety of mechanisms ranging from political to economic to military to preventing that from continuing as an ongoing operation. And so it's not, and even if somebody started it, you know, today and they did it for a couple of months before they were, the operation was taken down, it's not going to be the end of the world. You know, it'd be like a small volcano or something. And so maybe it's not good, but, but it's not catastrophic. And so I, so I think because there's no risk of a rogue deployment that's not relatively easily countered by conventional means, it just doesn't fall into that category where the knowledge acquisition leads to imminent harm that's not easily countered by other means. There's basically one means known to cause the earth to start cooling within our lifetimes or within the careers of current politicians. And if we really take climate threats seriously, you know, we might consider that we might want to start the earth cooling within our lifetime. So I'm not saying that this is, uh, will happen, but it, it just seems to me that if you really take climate threats seriously, you'd want to understand what would happen if somebody felt the need to cool the earth rapidly. The open letter says um, speculative hopes about the future availability of solar geoengineering technologies threaten commitments to mitigation. Do you think there's validity in that, evidence of that? That's not been my experience. There, um, I've seen it go the other way. And again, I don't want to name names here, but there's people who, and people who I would consider kind of right wing people who were skeptical about climate science and skeptical about energy system transition and who were thinking like, oh, let's, let's at least investigate solar geoengineering just as a backup, just in case there really is something to this climate change. And uh, I think in a way, solar geoengineering acts as a gateway drug to learning more about the climate system. And then they see, well, look, even though, you, they start looking at the model results and they're saying, well, look, if, if people were just cooking up the models to give the answers they want, why would they say that this works so well? You know, with that, and then they start looking into the physics and they say, oh, there really is physics here. And they, you know, then you start to say, well, maybe I should believe, if you're gonna believe how the solar geoengineering affects the climate system, well, why shouldn't you affect how the CO2 affects the climate system without the solar geoengineering? And so, and then people start realizing, oh, well, if really the CO2 is, continues to accumulate in the atmosphere and we're ramping up the solar geoengineering, that that end state is pretty ugly. And so that even if we have to do solar geoengineering, we're still going to have to transition off of fossil fuels uh, and that it's really not a substitute for an energy system transition. It's something that you might want uh, you, know, uh, you might want that as some palliative uh, care or some, uh, I, I don't know what, but you might want it to reduce uh, adverse effects while you're doing the energy system transition, but you don't, you still have to do the energy system transition. And so, uh, you know, anyway, I've seen several people move from skepticism on climate and energy system transi uh, transition enter the problem through the geoengineering lens and end up being advocates of energy system transition. One other critical point um, this campaign makes, they say the current global governance system is unfit to develop and implement the far reaching agreements needed to maintain fair, inclusive and effective political control over solar geoengineering deployment. How valid a critique is that of pursuing 
research. Again, I'm no expert, but I, I assume that's true. But I think uh, I think there's a big difference between solar geoengineering research and solar geoengineering deployment. Admitted, I mean, admitting that there is a fuzzy zone between the two things. That uh, you know, scientific tests tend to be limited, have limited resources, they're very limited in time, they're limited in space. You know, so that, I mean, I guess one of the famous ones, but this spice experiment, more or less somebody just wanted to put a hose to a balloon and spray some water in the sky. And you could say, oh yeah, there was a risk of the hose falling down and somebody getting hurt or something like this. But, but basically nobody thought the experiment posed any substantial direct harm, but it was the idea that, oh, this is a solar geoengineering experiment and that maybe this, yeah. So I guess there's two arguments for banning that type of experiment. One is that uh, we might, um, that the knowledge gained is itself harmful and we need to prevent this knowledge acquisition. But yeah, you raise a different issue, which is maybe a better argument that since uh, since there is a con continuum between one hose in the sky and an air force operating 24 seven over many years that we, we better, you know, draw the line early to, if we know we don't want what's at the end of that road, um, then we should prevent anybody from taking the first steps down that road. And I guess where I would reject is the hubris in assuming that we know where where we want to end up and that you know it might be i mean it might be that climate change is a lot worse than i think it will be and, and uh, you know uh it, you know maybe you know what if the big ice sheets are breaking up really rapidly and you know, we start getting meters of sea level rise and it's expected. And what if big swaths of the tropics starts being uninhabitable? And, you know, it might end up being worse than we think and we might want to use it. And, uh, you know, so that now when I say we, I mean, the humanity. So you've talked and, and used the terms no knowledge, uh, a number of times in your in your responses, um, but of course, getting society's agreement on what we know, what are the facts, is, is, is pretty challenging and can become even more so with the you know the way the internet works, conspiracy theories, and and, and all of this. And I mean, during the COVID pandemic, to take a different example, you know, we we saw pretty clearly the divisive consequences of disinformation, inadequate information, misunderstanding of information, and so much so that the World Health Organization coined the term the infodemic, which mm -hmm. went alongside the pandemic. Um, what have we learned from that experience? And I guess also the history of, of, of what we know around climate change in general, in terms of how we would go about actually establishing and sharing and winning trust in what we know about solar radiation modification. Well, this is obviously a tough question. I mean, if I had to say how my thinking has changed uh, over the last five or so years, I used to have a pretty much a um, uh, you, you know this kind of uh, almost Lockean view of rational you know humans as rational basically rational actors where the maybe that was the rationality was clouded by emotions, but that uh, you know the homo economicus was some kind of uh, reasonable representation of human beings and that you know now i'm thinking oh you know we evolved in small groups of hunter gatherers and probably the worst thing for us was to be banished to the forest by ourselves and so really this the, the centrality of group identity for human psychology. And we're basically willing to believe anything to avoid being rejected by our group. And I, I mean, not to be overly controversial, but I think this is how religions and, you know, 
if you can, if, you know, that, that if you want to be a member of the group, well, then you better share these religious beliefs. And so any, no matter how crazy the religion is, we'll believe it if the group, if that's, that's the thing with the group. And we see with this, uh, you know, with the response to coronavirus, how, you know, how uh, people's views on empirical facts closely align with their group identity. And, and so how to surmount this and get a more rational uh, assessment is, uh, I mean, that's the challenge of the day, not just with solar geoengineering, but with the whole rest of our political system. So, uh, yeah, so I guess there's a few things that I've just been trying to do personally to try to help, and I don't always, not always successful. But I think we need to uh, be much more uh, just supporting what we think might work and be a little more generous to other people, what other people are doing that we think isn't going to work. That, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think this climate challenge is plenty tough, but the climate community uh you know you know whether you're for against nuclear power or are you for against uh you know are you for against the solar geoengineering or for against carbon capture and storage and like yeah i feel like that that being against something has very limited utility you know that tell us what tell us what you think will work or what's useful for us to do and let's try to widen the pie and get more resources so that we can develop all of these pathways and that um, and so and I've been trying when somebody says things that I disagree with rather than to say oh that's a bunch of bull you know to to just ask questions, you know, to phrase my objection in terms of a question. Well, how would you deal with this concern or how would you deal with that? And I think, so I think there's just something in civility, I think just, uh, and generosity and that we just need to start being, uh, I know this is like a hard road to get to this point, but I think, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like, oh, when after 9-11, when the, World Trade Center came down and then the United States responded. You know, I thought we, we could respond magnanimously and we say, oh, we know these people did terrible things, but, you know, yes, the, the, there is real injustice in the world and inequality that needs to be addressed. And, you know, there, there was an opportunity there, but instead we responded with kidnapping and torture and violence and basically acted on the same level as the people who were attacking us and that and so I think it's the same thing that I, th I think that we need to take the high road and 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 try to uh, argue in favor of the facts and try to be positive and that when somebody says something we think is ridiculous don't just say you're a jerk but to say, well, how would you deal with this? I, and th I know this is an inadequate answer and maybe insufficient, and I'm not saying the forces of darkness won't win, uh, but I, I, I think just in, I, I think we just have to try to stick to the high road. I'm not sure there is an answer. If there was one, we'd, we'd, we'd be applying it. Um, you talk about staying positive. Uh, and you also mentioned the forces of darkness. I mean, it's, climate change can be a pretty bleak problem to deal with, where you can start to see things in, in, in that light. And it can take a toll on professionals who, who study it and also find themselves caught up in these debates. How do you, and maybe we'll finish on this, how do you personally maintain some sense of agency, hope, enthusiasm, whilst not kidding yourself about the sheer scale of the challenge ahead? Well, I mean, first of all, I've been involved in, I have to say this, I've been involved in trying to deal with climate change now for over four decades. So I first started getting involved in 1979, which is pretty long time ago. So that, uh, 
And, you know, it basically has felt mostly like hitting your head against a brick wall. And maybe there's been a little motion, but again, the amount of motion compared to what there needs to be is in the single digit percents, you know, so that, um, so, you know, I guess a lot of um, this, I guess there's a few different things. One is I get to work with super intelligent postdocs and, you know, these people who are motivated and smart and nice people doing interesting work. You know, I, I get to talk to all kinds of interesting people. So the sort of social, you know, I think a lot of our personal happiness has to do with our social interactions and not our intellectual beliefs. And so my intellectual beliefs, but, you know, I'm, but I'm constantly in a state of existential anxiety over what can I do to be effective. I mean, I feel like I'm in a better position to be effective than, you know, 99.99% of the people on the planet in that I'm, you know, I've been fortunate enough to help bring information to Bill Gates, uh, get to communicate with other people. And, uh, you know, I feel like, oh, given the resources I have and connections I have, I should be a lot more effective than I am. And I've, and I, I constantly feel like I'm underperforming. And this is, but I think this is just, um, yeah, I, I think there, I think you could, uh, the people who are easily satisfied with their own performance probably don't accomplish so much. And then one of the things of trying to accomplish a lot is feeling like, oh, you're always feeling, falling far short of your ambition. And so, but, if, you know, if I knew what I could do to be more effective, I would do it. But I, and I'm constant every day I, I try to think, oh, man, what could I do that would actually make a difference to somebody? I think one thing I'm trying to be, and this is maybe part of the thing of aging, I still have a good healthy ego and like to promote myself, they, that I'm much more now of um, getting more satisfaction in helping other people and acting as facilitator to other people and doing some things in the background a little more. And, um, and anyway, yeah, but I think though the understanding that nobody, you know, we haven't solved the climate problem or we haven't, you know, addressed climate challenges in a substantive way. And, and, and so this is again, why I'm less critical of other people's strategies and saying, it's not like my strategy has been successful or your strategy has been successful. So who am I to criticize somebody else who has an unsuccessful strategy? they like, let's just try it. Anyway, I don't know what to do with this, but it feels like hitting your head against the wall. Luckily I have good social relations because the amount of progress on addressing climate challenges has been disappointing. Well, you certainly haven't been disappointed today in the C2G talk. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Ken Caldera, and uh, we'll see how this all turns out. Yeah, hopefully for the best. <laughs>